Kyle, welcome to today's LinkedIn Live. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Stephanie Garcia, commercial manager here at Levin APAC, um, coming to you from Singapore. Um, to give you a brief intro, Levin is the parent company of global leaders and specialist recruitment for the fintech, health tech, green tech, retail tech, and ed tech sectors um, through our portfolio brands. So we have Storm 3, two, sorry, Storm 3, Storm 4, Storm 5, and Storm 6. So Storm 2 is a leading global fintech uh, talent marketplace that focuses on connecting organizations with a large network of senior talent. Um, with this event today, we would like to highlight and discuss the topic of gender disparity in fintech, uh, within the fintech industry specifically. <clears throat> so we have invited successful women who have worked within the fintech industry to speak today. They come from a variety of different backgrounds and will be sharing their experiences within the industry and will showcase the various opportunities and barriers as well in uh, gender equality for fintech. We hope that this event will provide insights on how we can all work together um, to make you know, fintech a more inclusive space. Um, and so, yeah, I think we can get started and kick off with our you know, guest speakers introductions. Um, so we will have Georgia who will be joining us in a little bit. We're having a bit of uh, technical issues on that side, um, but we also have Jacqueline and Sophia. Jacqueline, over to you. Uh, good afternoon, good morning. Um, everyone. Um, my name is Jacqueline. I'm currently CEO at Fundabeam Exchange. We are a fintech um, exchange for private company. And um, my background, just to give you a little bit of background, is quite diverse. I've been in the financial services and um, consulting industry for 32 years. I started as a financial and then management consultant um, in IT and then uh, moved on rapidly into um, mergers and acquisitions and in investment banking for half of my career after that in uh, M&A, special sits and capital market structured finance. Um, then the other half um, was spent in alternative investments, um, including fintech. Um, I've also sort of founded uh, fintechs. Currently, I'm not the founder of Funderbeam. Our founder is a female founder, Kaidi Rusalab. She is was ex-CEO of NASDAQ First North and um, Thunder Beam is very much her brainchild and, and we, we are NASDAQ First North Private Markets 2.0. Can I say that? Um, live stream. So we, we are a digital exchange that services private companies and we want to support them from their first money funding right through their entire journey um, until the exit for both early stage investors, founders, and the companies to support the growth along the way. And we try and bring liquidity to the private markets also in secondaries. Um, I'm currently based in Singapore. I've worked all around the world and this is a very exciting time in Asia. Um, our team is spread globally. So I, I'm very much looking forward to this se session to talk about you know, uh, the changes in, in financial services, the FinTech. We have a very diverse team. So thank you for inviting me, Steph. Thank you for coming. Um, thank you. And uh, and Sophia, what about you? So good afternoon um, or morning. Yeah. Um, so I'm Sophia, managing associate in Storm Two. Um, I joined the company um, last May, and currently I head two of the um, two out of six of the verticals in Storm Two, uh, which are recent compliance and fin uh, finance and operations. So of course, uh, we also have other functions that we support in terms of hiring, um, you know, such as engineering, data, sales, and marketing products as well in some too. So my role has transitioned uh, from being a consultant previously to now being a manager where I now uh, manage and help support um, other really driven, lively consultants to enhance and work on filling the role. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um... Perfect. So I think we'll we'll get started uh, with the questions again. Uh, we'll probably have Georgia uh, joining in, um, but yeah, Jacqueline, let's let's get started on this end. Um, so yeah, in terms of um, in terms of the questions that we have prepared, um, you know, obviously feel free uh, with in the comments. I see I see some comments. Everyone saying hello. Um, if our viewers have any questions, please feel free to. Um, uh, you know, to ask away, and we will also include those as well, right? Um, okay, so let's get started. Um, so yeah, historically, the fintech industry has been, you know, male-dominated and has, you know, seemingly failed to understand women's needs, right? So fintech has, uh, you know, a bigger gender problem than it realizes, um, labeling it as an industry that has been, you know, founded for men, run by men, and making products for men, right? Um, so what, what do you think of this situation? Um, shall I start? Shall I start, Steph or Sophie? Yes, go ahead. Um, 
Okay, so I, I think the industry is is evolving. I definitely am seeing a lot more women um, in the industry. Um, however, I think if you think about fintech, it's financial technology. Oh, Georgia, Georgia's yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. So um, financial um, technology, and, and if you look at the skill sets for this segment, it's, it's very much, you know, logical thinking. Um, it's, it's also um, then, um, sorry, logical thinking, cybersecurity, so, and, and then strong critical thinking. Then we look at the backgrounds that lead to that, right? It's programming skills, coding skills, quant statistics and traditionally these haven't been areas where there are a lot of women um, and so the STEM education is, is encouraging more women so I think slowly it's transitioning as, as we see more and more um, female talent um, being groomed through the education system. Also um, I, I guess you know with the transformations and the big technology changes uh, it requires quite a lot of time commitment. Um, and if you're talking about founders, um, the whole concept of being a founder is very much um, all consuming. So I think women um, in the majority also prioritize having a family. I think there are various factors coming into play, but uh, we'll let kind of Georgia chime in and, and then we can continue the conversation. Hi. Oh, Georgia, sorry, I don't think we can hear you. Okay. All right, sorry. Apologies for that. Um, it seems that, you know, um, our, our, the technical issues persist. Um, not to worry, we'll, we'll, we'll try, we'll try again. Um, okay, um, not, not to worry, we'll, we'll come back to, to Georgia uh, when she's back. Um, so yeah, thank you, thank you for that, Jacqueline. Um, I think, yeah, I think, so our next question um, is more of a broad question to, you know, understand, uh, you know, to give you an opportunity to, to uh, you know, give it your own um, dimension on that one as well, right? So what is what is the impact of, of FinTech um, and, you know, its gender dimensions? Sophia, do you want to start on this one? Oh, it's you can, yeah, you can go ahead. Yeah, um, I think... Um, I, I will touch on a bit more later on, yeah. Okay. Steph, what sort of dimensions were you mentioning? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, what, what have you seen in terms of the impact of, uh, on, on fintech? Um, this, you know, depends on you how, how uh, you would like to, which angle you would like to uh, approach this from, right? Um, but what is the, the, the impact of fintech? This can be, um, you know, in terms of uh, how, how that has, um, affected negatively or positively, um, you know, women in general, or, um, you know, how is it in terms of the industry and the, the uh, gender dimensions within that? Okay, I, I think, you know, there's been a, a, a broad shift, there's been a change, and, and a lot of it in terms of COVID has brought about a, a huge adoption. Um, I think in, in prior to COVID, prior to the pandemic, there's a high human touch element. And with the contactless um, philosophy now, uh, every and, and particularly with, with um, if you talk about female adopters, you, you're talking about mothers and parents who are conscientious of, you know, healthcare and health and, and the well-being. And, and so the current um, fintech ecosystem, if you talk about the entire spectrum, you start from the payments ecosystem, the online e-commerce, and then you, you move up the chain to sort of digital banking. Um, it, it becomes a concept that, that resonates very well with, with, you know, the female parents, the female um, sort of uh, the female professionals as well, right? Because we're doing a lot more hybrid work from home. So efficiency is a factor. Um, having the ease of use from, you know, managing your household with e-commerce, um, payments, online payments, um, and also sort of delegating different tasks and being able to control it with, with remotely with online access, I think that has really facilitated the adoption. Um, and that has, with, with the COVID, the other accelerating factor is the fear factor of not knowing, the fear factor of, you know, the um, 
technology overtaking the human element um, that has kind of reduced, which also means that if we look, then we, if we move then into the other side, the worker side that's in the industry. So not so much the consumer side. Now we flip to where the workforce is coming from. You know, I, I think there's more engagement and education with the community, with the society. And I think it's becoming, um, not only is it becoming more prevalent in our lives, but the understanding now is clearer that tech and fintech is not here to replace humans. It's not here to replace jobs. It's actually here to enhance uh, the user experience. It's here to make life easier. So it's actually replacing the non human intelligent jobs you know it's, it's the automation part is to improve efficiency it's to help business become more um sustainable and that actually is quite a crucial point in this in this these times and women tend and you know women in fintech um is increasing because um sustainability and and um being supportive of this ecosystem thematic is quite is, is quite a, sounds a strong chord, right? With with a lot of the uh, the gender, both men and 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 women. So it's no longer just you know. Um, traditionally, you see a lot of men in project um, offices in in IT transformation projects, just from the nature of where the technical skill comes from. Um, but more and more so, um, you're seeing you know the you. UI designers, user interface designers, they are female because there's the soft element coming in there, the creative components. Um, you see product designers in the UX experience. You know, in at Thunderbeam, our chief product officer is, is female, you know, um, and uh, she's been also the CFO of two unicorns or fintechs, um, you know, and then Kylie, obviously our founder, she's she's female, and then we are global marketing head um, is an ex-founder herself, you know, so, you know, the softer elements are coming into play in fintech. And so that's drawing the female talent as well, because one of the main components um, currently that we see in cross-border fintech, because payments is cross-border, wealth management is growing in the robo-advisory space, um, and there's a systemic change in financial services. So, you know, the whole ecosystem and infrastructure ranging from regulatory, from legal, um, from tax, and then technical side, it's, it's, there's a systemic change right across the board. And what that means is with fintechs and, and a lot of these are younger companies, we have to roll out our sleeves. We have to do more than mono silo roles, which means, you know, lots of cross-functional collaborations. And that means utilizing soft skills. Um, that, and, and that generally, you know, um, is a, a more sort of evident skill set. I'm not saying, you know, prevalent, but I'm saying more evident skill set of, of the female gender. And, and I, I think that humanizing of fintech is attracting a greater diversity um, uh, in 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 people. Um, so 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 in terms of gender diversity, um, oftentimes we also talk about cognitive uh, alignment, right? Um, so you could have female and male um, in alignment, um, but and and without cognitive dissonance. So that's quite important. So it's attracting the right talent, skill set um, to come together to be able to collaborate. I, I think I'm seeing a lot of change. Um, and in countries such as US and in countries um, in, in a lot of the Asia countries where childcare um, is easier, it's not such a huge burden on the purse strings. You see more female founders. Um, um, I think it's harder in places like Australia. That's where Georgia is. And perhaps I could chime in on her behalf while she's trying to log on. Um, when I was back in Australia, you know, there weren't so many of us female founders because childcare was enormously prohibitive cost, in, in terms of cost, right? So so it's harder. That There's a lot of time sacrifice. There's a lot of effort required. So, um, you know, that comes into play as well. Um, and... Um, it, and alongside that is the whole uh, support infrastructure. You know, how is it supported commercially? What's the adoption in, in the environment? Um, 
in the economy? Is there consumer adoption? Is there a supply chain adoption? You know, are there is there support from governments um, for early stage startups for them um, both on a tax side and from a regulatory side and from a rebate side? How do we support these young companies, fintechs, to thrive? Everything comes into play, and I think. Um, as the as the, the ecosystem matures, I believe we will see more and more females coming in because females tend to be a little bit more cautious um, than the men who kind of go, let's dive in and crack on with it. And and um, you know, I think those might be some of the various factors among many, among many. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Quite quite interesting. I think um, you you. You briefly touched on the, you know, um, automation part of that and how that has, you know, increased adoption, especially, you know, during COVID where we were kind of forced in a way <laughs> to, to automate quite a few things, right? Um, but there's actually a study um, by BIS, so Bank for um, International Settlements, that has shown yeah. that, you know, women are significantly less likely to use fintech products or services, um, you know, that are offered by fintech entrants than men, right? Um, so. Do you think this is still true? And if so, what is the case? I don't have statistics, Stephanie, to back me up on this. So what I can offer is anecdotal evidence. Yeah, that's um, fine. <laughs> and I think it's bifurcated slightly. So, you know, there are a lot of products out there, right? It, and, and I didn't even touch on crypto, you know. Um, and, and I think um, a lot of it, from from my personal views, and this is a sample size of one view, is um, that you have to be, people are comfortable to use a tool that they're familiar with and that they're knowledgeable about. Um, I don't go into crypto, I don't touch it um, because I think it's still young. It requires a whole infrastructure to be set up around it. Um, CBDC based on fiat is slightly different, um, but um, I'm supportive of the ecosystem, the infrastructure that surrounds it. So it depends on what you're saying, right, in terms of adoption. Um, I see a lot of females adopting payment apps. So that's also fintech. I see a lot of um, females adopting wellness um, type um, linked fintech apps to insurance products you know so it's it's what resonates most in terms of their prioritizing in in their life um I see also a lot of females adopting e-commerce apps um and and i can't speak so much for men i think the the iot type applications are as quite strong in the male adoption um environment um, and definitely a lot more of the trading type platforms but that's because traditionally those are the ecosystems they're more familiar with right I, I mean I, I think back to uh, my days at investment banking there's not a lot of female traders around you know it's, it's a lot of male so so it leads back to what you're saying it's uh, apps and and technology that's been developed by um, male. So they're more familiar with it. And we see a lot of the um, active investment portfolio type apps, right? Um, and smart um, wealth management apps. Um, I think a lot of these were also founded by males. There are some female founded ones and, and I can name a few. And these are by really, really smart females, you know, but we are in the minority. So statistically, if, if you're if you're citing statistic, we will always be in the minority, but that doesn't mean that the rate of adoption is not accelerating more for females than male. I don't have that statistic to quote you, um, but you know, even, um, yeah, th there are a lot, I mean, Sally Krawcheck is one of uh, the few um, that's globally well-known um, that has started, you know, a, a FinTech investment platform. Um, th there's others, um, as well, and there are some who have exited. I mean, Kaidi Ruslip, our founder, is another one. Um, there are a few in Singapore. Um, I I could name them, but then I'm going to 
seem quite biased. So, so um, yeah, then we go back to the unconscious biases that we were talk, chatting about yesterday. Um, yeah. Sophia, we'd love to hear from you. I feel like I'm dominating the whole session. Oh, no, no, no. But I see. Oh, oh <laughs> I don't know. Um, so I, um, I think regarding this, I, I mean, uh, I'm not very well versed in that uh, in this, but I was just, um, I mean, I gave it a thought as well, right? Regarding the previous questions, it was, um, I know we have uh, moved on, but if I could touch on uh, about the, you know, impact of fintech and the gender dimensions, I, I thought that, you know, just personal opinion, like fintech is getting a lot of attention these days, and actually for the right reasons. I think mean, comparing from like traditional companies. Um, with um, you know fintech companies, there are definitely a lot, lot more female hires. You know, um, in particular, they are less common, um, especially in the tech or finance roles. You know, related roles, as you mentioned, like traders or engineers. I think this is definitely mm. on a, a statistic. You know, it's, it's statistically proven that more hires this days, right? I think is that um, the beauty of fintech that um, I mean, with uh, the welfare, the form of communication, the openness between the management, the founders and the people in the on the ground supporting the business um, actually helps um, for this female talent, you know, to come across as less daunting for them to actually um, enter into this in this, uh, this space. So I think it helps attract that I and, and with that it, it definitely helps attract a lot of right talent these days um, to skill up whether or not um, it was previously male um, you know dominated space. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that kind of ties into uh, to the next question that I had. You know, you're talking about senior talent, right? Um, and as we all know, you know, usually these uh, these ideas or any new measures, you know, that uh, you know will affect uh, consumers and the industry later on, right? Um, are uh, decided by C-suite, right? Um, so, to what extent, uh, Jacqueline, do you think that improving you know gender diversity in the C-suite roles will safeguard the industry? I actually think gender diversity across the board is, is very helpful and, and particularly in um, very high growth and high and very fluid environments, right? So, so fintech is changing, it's evolving all the time. You know, we're still seeing it maturing. Um, there are so many moving parts at the moment and even more so now to juggle, right? With, with the geopolitical changes, with macroeconomic upheavals. Um, so, and, and when, when we're in that environment of being really fluid and everything's uncertain, um, the, the way innovation happens is when you have a lot of diverse thinking. You know, it's thinking outside the box. It's thinking of solutions that's beyond the, the, the normal framework boundaries. And how does it come about? And that comes about through, you know, lots of different views lots of so everybody working towards converging to its common goal but coming with different perspectives to create something new that's innovation right and and you it's very difficult to innovate if you you don't think outside the box if there's less diversity and everyone is siloed and and thinking along the same route that's that doesn't really help cultivate or nurture innovation so i think diversity in and of itself is very important and going back to your point about fintechs tend to be very flat in structure so definitely the messaging the top level strategic messaging top down is very important but the adoption and 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 the sense of conviction to drive through um, to implement and to um, generate solutions is all hands by everyone um, so mm -hmm the diversity comes right through the organization. So, so from my personal experience working at, at Thunderbeam, we have five or six offices, six now globally, and we work as a one team. Um, you know, we have calls where we can't meet in person and we, we work cross-functionally in project teams to drive through a solution because everybody plays a part. It's like Lego, right? You, you all come together with different parts to form a whole. So it's, it's, it, it's no longer a, 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 a top-down structure. It's a top-down messaging and empowerment, right? And then with the empowerment, everybody is, is um, sort of energized to create the solution. And 
also, I think in fintech, what, what we have to appreciate is the pace at which we work is very different. You know, it's, it's very fast. It's a lot faster. You have to be very agile. So that means that, you know, diversity helps because the ability to be agile means you've got to be able to adopt to think and to pivot quickly. Um, and that comes with a lot of different ideas being um, stirred in the pot and, and then, um, you know, experimentation happening. Um, and then it's, it's quick delivery of pivots, readjustment, realignment, and then, you know, the cycle goes on that way. Um, and for that to happen, um, definitely um, diversity, cultural diversity, gender diversity, um, but not a cognitive dissonance, right? It's a, a cognitive alignment. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, I think in general, diversity and collaboration. Collaboration is more the, the um, execution mechanism. So diversity is the raw material that goes mm -hmm. into then the collaboration, the ability to work together harmoniously as a team. Uh, to create the solution. That is a very important key element. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's, um, I, I, I like what you mentioned in terms of, you know, uh, diversity being the raw material. Um, you know, that's, that's, um, that's a brilliant way to put it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Georgia, <laughs> could, you, could you try speaking? Let's see if, it's, if the mic is working now. I'm gonna try once again. Yes. Uh, yes, here we go. Experimentation. <laughs> Yay. There we go. There we go. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Um, thanks for joining us, Georgia, and thanks for your your uh, you know patience and perseverance. You know with this uh, you know the tech issues. Um, technology is great when it works, and then when it doesn't, it's quite frustrating, isn't it? But um, but yeah, thank you so much, Georgia. Um, could you give us a brief intro into um, you know who you are and, and what you do? Yes. So I'm Georgia Gianaros. I am in sales and partnerships within the fintech industry here in Australia. Um, more specifically, payments. Um, I saw my new role at Easy Pay on Monday, um, who are a payments provider who um, target uh, direct debits and subscription billing um, and utilizing in Australia what we call uh, real time payments. Um, more specifically, Pay2, which is your real time direct debits. Uh, bypassing the three-day um, wait for uh, payments to be cleared. So that's exciting and that's launching and uh, that's my introduction. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think, um, you know, we've, we've gone over a, a few questions already, um, but I think actually one question that I wanted to ask you both and kind of, you know, get your um, different points of view on this one, um, you know, was because... You know, we, we had discussed the the different um, you know how how gender disparity can manifest right within the industry, but I'm interested as well in, in seeing how that gender disparity can manifest depending on the region or the culture, right? Um, I think it could be interesting as well to see it from an Aussie point of view, and then also you know uh, Jacqueline, you're you know you're Australian, but you've also worked in um, uh, you know in APAC and, and um, over in London and many other countries as well, right? So. Um, just to kind of see, you know, what the what the difference is and how you both have maybe had different experiences and depending on the, on the uh, context, right? Yeah, so um, I think within Australia, you know, fintech could be considered as such a multifaceted industry um, where you've got your marketing, your sales, products, um, software development, uh, and so forth. So we are starting to see women... Uh, transition even from financial services through to financial technology um, but there are far too few women within fintech um, in addition to that far too few women fintech leaders um, and we are uh, absolutely underrepresented in the industry however with that said we have some wonderful fintech leaders in australia who are female um, and are recognized and are very successful within their startups. And I just want to mention a couple. Um, so feel free to look them up. One of them is Catherine McConnell, who has created Bright. It is a, um, a 
it is a financial service for solar panels. So more specifically looking at sustainability within the fintech industry. Um, and we've got Simone Joyce, who uh, has founded Paper Plane, another payments provider who has recently partnered with a major um, Australian bank, um, again, to, uh, to partner within that pay to real-time direct debit space. So we are starting to see a change. There is an increase in female leadership um, and creating startups, but most certainly it is still dominated by men. Yeah, I hope I hope we'll we'll get to the day when um, when it's no longer you know where you can remember people because of how few there are. Right? I hope that one day it becomes such a um, you know normal and and. Uh, you know, part of, of, of the industry that it's, that it's no longer remarkable, but I'm really happy to hear about those, uh, you know, success stories within Australia. Um, yeah, Jacqueline, what about you in terms of, you know, having had that experience in, in multiple um, cultures? I do see a lot more female founders in, in Asia. Um, that could be just a statistical thing. There is a larger population base across Asia, similarly in US. Um, but I think I touched on this slightly as well uh, earlier that, you know, um, the um, ability to have an integrated uh, work and personal life um, is easier in Asia um, in terms of cost of, of childcare. Um, and also, um, uh, yeah, and, and there is, I think, a few more platforms and organizations supportive of female founders. Um, the VC scene as well in Asia and, and US, there are more female, um, uh, there, uh, there are more VCs investing in female founders. Um, that plays a huge part in encouraging the growth of um, fintechs led by females um, because a lot of us are bootstrapped and then we create um, the value proposition but the growth the growth path the acceleration of growth um, that requires institutional money that requires um, first of all VC and then PE money and then um, all the other options and, and that's something that you know Funder Beam Exchange is trying um, very hard to help solve this problem of liquidity um, you know and, and not just have it focus on gender. Uh, on our platform we have a lot of um, companies that are female-led um, sign up onto our platform and have a look at who they are. Um, I, I won't you know, I, I, I encourage you to do that. Um, then you can have a look at who they are. Um, separately, I think, you know, organizations like Money 2020 um, and Rise Up program, I, of which I'm an alumni, that's very supportive of um, fintech leaders. And to George's point, you know, fintech spans a huge spectrum. Um, it, it, it was born originally from payments, but it's grown so much. And I think in a lot of the other spaces um, of fintech, um, you know, insure tech, which is a form of fintech, right? A regulatory tech, which is another form of fintech. Um, we are seeing more female founders. Um, uh, so one of them is, is, you know, the legal tech side uh, where it talks about compliance um, and risk management. I'm seeing more female founders there. So I, I think the ecosystem has to be supportive. And I think in Australia, when I was back home in Australia, the ecosystem is not as uh, broad as what we see in Asia and also in the States and, and in Europe especially. So um, that could be another factor. So hopefully with a lot more um, cross-border alliances um, and collaborations, that, that ecosystem, that cross-border um, globalization, right, um, will, will facilitate the growth and will facilitate um, more female founders. I, I think a lot of it is capital driven as well. Yeah. Not sure if Georgia, Georgia, what do you think? Um, I, I tend to agree. I think that it is starting to slowly adapt um, with more female founders. I mean, my experience personally is, uh, you know, I'd worked for my previous company for three and a half years, mainly dealing with startups. And out of all the clients over the last three and a half years, there was only one female founder that I had spoken to regarding payments. 
Um, but again, there are there are maybe two handfuls of female founders that are um, that have founded startups within Australia. Um, I think it's important to recognise that um, we do require more females within the industry, um, and to recognise that it does stem from leadership. So creating a healthy um, balanced gender leadership to ensure that they continue um, to um, for females to enter the industry, to have that supportive, collaborative, flexible environment um, to ensure that um, there is no bias within that industry. Perfect. I think um, uh, we have a, a question uh, from one of the viewers. So uh, I apologize in advance for my mispronouncing your name uh, to Fanny Rishi, who is writing to us from um, Mauritius. Um, so yeah, so his question is, um, you know, what are the measures taken by the fintech industry uh, to touch base with women around the world? And that actually ties into what was my next question, which is, uh, you know, what can stakeholders um, within the fintech industry do to improve outcomes and create more gender diversity in the fintech community. So I think it's, you know, they both tie in together um, quite well. Georgia, why don't you start? We're starting to see um, groups specifically um, to help support and uh, empower and encourage women to um, group together. Um, women in Payments, for example, is, is uh, a group um, that was founded in um, in North America, I think that more of that needs to be created uh, globally and in particular in Australia. Um, but it, but FinTech as a whole, and especially in Australia, it is quite the community. Um, it is a small community and uh, irrespective of the gender inequality, um, there is a lot of supportive um, members within the community who are family-like and um, we tend to work well together and, and, and quite supportive of each other. Okay, perfect. Jacqueline, what about you? Um, I'll speak about Singapore since I'm based here in Singapore. Um, I, I, I see quite a few avenues for female um, founders and, and support for female and fintech. Yeah, I'm, as I mentioned, Money 2020, Rise Up, and that's global. You have a chapter in US, a chapter in Europe, and a chapter in Asia. Um, and, and then we have, you know, other ecos uh, other networks. So Singapore Fintech Association is very, very good. We have a women's group. And then um, within the women's group, you know, it's a very healthy the exchange of dialogue all the time um, and and also I think there are committees um, set up within Singapore Fintech Association that um, that talk about um, you know uh, gender issues um, and uh, we have other you know we have VCs that are founded by females um, uh, a good friend of mine I if she's listening in you know Sophia group it's for females um, it talks about you know, encouraging females to invest and it's it's on a fintech platform to be and, and you know, Herod Group is supporting all female founders um, and then we have She Loves Tech. We have, you know, quite a few, quite a lot more I find um, in, in Singapore um, in terms of networks and, and supports and ecosystems um, to what I saw when I was back home in Australia. Um, but I'm, I'm seeing more and more so as well that these are growing beyond the borders. And so um, I'm sure it's, it will be embracing um, countries that are not yet feeling very supported um, for the female founder leadership, right? So um, the message is, is there, the message um, is being heard. I, I think it's just a matter of adoption and engagement. Uh, COVID hasn't helped in the last couple of years in, in terms of, you know, encouraging more engagement in, in a sense the face-to-face -face engagement is lacking and it's very difficult when you're talking cross-cultural um, uh, relationship building right um, but what has been 
the silver lining of COVID is the realization that the world is a lot smaller. So everybody hops on online to Zoom. And I think in certain areas that has really helped to bring the female fintech founder community closer together, the global community that I'm talking about. So now I think with borders opening up, it's the next step where those relationships globally that, that have been built through virtual links um, will be strengthened. And I, th I do think there's going to be a change. Um, and, um, you know, as with everything tech, I do not think it's going to be linear. I think it, it will be ex exponential. Um, it's, it's, um, it will grow quickly. Um, Australia has always kind of suffered being um, in a different time zone <laughs> and um, geographically quite far away. Um, so, but I'm seeing a, a lot more Aussie companies here in Singapore, a lot more founders. So I think um, Georgia holds strong. Um, yeah, and reach out and reach out, you know, um, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think as you mentioned, Jacqueline, um, during COVID, networking did take a bit of a hit at the beginning. Um, mm. You know, I think um, th throughout many industries, uh, you know, we did rely on events and, um, uh, you know, to, to go and, 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 and meet with people face to face. And that element is lacking. Um, you know, I think, yeah, definitely, as you mentioned, you, you do build um, deeper relationships, right, uh, face to face. So, um, um, but yeah, I think, I think we all did adapt uh, through technology, uh, you know, uh, Zoom and Teams, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, um, business trips again and, and going to, uh, to events because, yeah, as, as you mentioned, I think that um, human, human aspect is, is missing. And I think that's really what is uh, quite powerful at the end of the day. Um, so, yeah, perfect. I think at this point we'll, we'll uh, move on to questions that are a little bit more uh, recruitment related. So, uh, Sophia, your time to shine. Uh, you know, in, terms of, um, in terms of this, right, because, you know, obviously recruitment does play a part um, in terms of, you know, uh, helping or not, you know, the gender disparity within uh, fintech, right? Um, so maybe, Sophia, you want to take this one first, and then we'll have Georgia and Jacqueline, um, uh, you know, uh, give their, their, their uh, opinion as well afterwards, right? Um, so, um, you know, or, or, you know, going through a recruitment process as a candidate, what are the common biases that you notice um, that are gender specific and how can we avoid that? So unfortunately, yeah, um, one of the main things that um, are frequently pointed out from time to time would be, you know, that usually centered around female um, or with female candidates, you, uh, they are usually like, you know, what's their family, uh, if they have family plannings going on soon, um, and, or if they have, you know, uh, any in intention to take maternity leave in the near future, or, you know, things like whether they are pregnant or not, those are questions that actually would usually be um, brought up. So I think one way to avoid it is um, by offering, you know, flexible work options so that um, if the employees, is, you know, they, they have that option, they can set their schedule um, to accommodate with the other responsibilities. So um, that, you know, if they have any maternity leave um, or childcare that they have to, to, to handle, um, they, they have that, that room for, for them to, to just shift around. Georgia, Jacqueline, anything to, to add on to that in terms of biases and in, in, in recruitment and hiring? I'll let you go ahead, Jacqueline. Yeah, it's it's a very tricky um, it's a very tricky element to juggle. Um, so on the one hand, we have to consider the cost of hiring an employee and that um, you know the cost is um, balanced against the contribution and also allocation of resources in, in a growing fintech. So I, I think that's where some of those questions stem from. Um, what I do appreciate from having worked in many different countries is, you know, it is a parental leave rather than, you know, the females going on nine months maternity leave. Um, the, the parenting is shared, the parenting load is shared between males and females. So with that sort of lens um, in mind, uh, 
um, when one hires, it's not just whether the female is going to get pregnant. Um, it's whether, you know, it, it's, it's equally the same consideration for the male, whether the male would be taking parental leave. So at the end of the day, I think uh, one needs to factor that in as a human cost. Um, but more importantly, in, in hiring, I, I mean, we are hiring at the moment and, and the way I've approached it is very, very much um, trying to be very objective across the board so that it's fair to all the candidates appreciate what we're trying to achieve with the hire right it's it's uh should be as much as possible on merit and on um the fit um organizationally and also as as an organization in fintechs particularly where where i'm at we value being a family and so, you know, that extends to employees, um, right? So being a family means that, you know, your personal life is part and parcel of who you are as a, a team member. Um, and that needs to be weighed alongside skills and experience that is brought on board um, and the levels of contribution. Um, it's it's not an easy answer. So I, I I've what we've done here um, on our part is create a balanced scorecard and and rate every candidate according to that. So it's fair because we're all humans, um, which means that it is not um, you are not an outlier if you you're going to have children, right? So all humans have have the option to have a family is what I'm saying. Um, and actually, Sophia, in some countries, you're not allowed to ask if someone's going to have babies or if you're pregnant. Yeah. Oh, it's just what, what I... the... <laughs> Sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I don't know. It's just as, uh, as a candidate, these are things I've heard, you know, from when we had we jump on a call with them. Um, and, and I'll be um, equally shocked, I would, <laughs> I would say. Yeah. I think um, there there are some countries where it is illegal, but unfortunately, having worked in recruitment as well in, in, in other countries, it is something that I have heard. And I have actually experienced it as well as a candidate. Uh, yes, you know, so, we all um, have, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And and not that long ago, uh, just, uh, you know, probably five years ago. Um, so, so, yeah, it is. Let, let me just flip that a little bit, right? So uh, interviewing is a two-way um, process. Yeah. Um, the candidate, it's also the, the opportunity for the candidate to decide what organization the candidate wants to work with, you know, mm -hmm. um, and um, it's, it's um, you know, it's a view into what to expect um, once one is in there. So, so it's, you know, make the decision, right, understand um, yeah. what you're deciding on. So it's a two-way street, I would say. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Um, what about you, Georgia? Anything to, to add on this? Uh, I do agree with Sophia and Jacqueline. Um, I think that uh, the determining factor is parental leave for women. Um, in addition to that is flexibility in the workplace um, and having employers, employers um, accommodate to a hybrid working environment for women or whether or not... Um, it is taking a few hours off during the day and working at night. I think post-pandemic, um, we've seen that employers have pivoted and accommodated, um, especially in the times of the Great Resignation. Um, employers are willing to hold on to um, loyal, productive staff and are accommodating um, to that flexible working environment as a result. Yeah, and I think... I think it, sorry, go ahead. So, yeah, I, I was just going to say, I, I think the um, silver lining with fintechs is we're able to do that. Um, I think in the more traditional financial institutions, um, that would not have been possible um, based, of the, based on the old ecosystem and, and the, the old infrastructure, but very fortunately in fintech. And that's one of the draw cards to working in a fintech is that you know, uh, there's 24 hours in a day and it's about productivity um, and we are local globally, right? Um, so uh, the focus is on delivering, is on performance um, and there's a lot of trust. I, I think the hybrid 
um, work situation with COVID has really highlighted that, you know, um, one tends, one values trusted um, team members who deliver, right? And and it's it's you know um, anybody can be truant, anyone, you know, the the old environment of everyone having to be in the office where it's not needed, it's more also to ensure productivity. But I think um, in, 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 in a sense, I'm not saying 100%, but there's an element of that. Um, but it's a very different environment in fintech. Um, and that's one of the beauties of, of working in a fintech. But then it then the, 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 the onus is on accountability and you, you need to attract the right talent. So the conversation should move away from whether one is going to be pregnant or have children or, you know, intend to, um, to how productive and how trustworthy um, and how accountable the, the, you know, team member is going to be um, because we work a lot also independently as well as in a team. And the team delivers when all the parts come together, which means that every single person needs to take ownership on the part that we play um, in the whole process and the whole fabric. Um, I think that's one of the very defining features in, in fintech in a fast growth company. Um, so, yeah, hopefully the conversation starts to shift, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I think, um, I think one of the, the upsides of, of COVID, if we can call it that, I guess, was uh, was that it actually, um, you know, uh, shattered that myth of, you know, it's if, if people work from home uh, or if we have flexible, uh, you know, work, um, uh, you know, structures, then, you know, product productivity will go down. And that, that wasn't the case. And actually, for a lot of companies, it actually went up, mm. right? So I think mm. um, that was definitely a benefit to, to women as well, right, within the workforce, mm. because it, it was able to, you know, they were able to juggle uh, more effectively, right? You know, working uh, from home and 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 you know uh, their their other duties um, at home or, or whatever it is that they were focusing on. Less well, guilt. Right? So, Less guilt. Yeah, as yeah, well. and also and also more time. I think that time that yeah. that was spent commuting could be spent, you know, doing something else or yeah. you know something for yourself, etc. Um, so yeah, I think I think that was the upside of it um, in in terms of you know having a little bit of uh, more flexibility for everyone. Right. Um, but that also, you know, trans translates to working dads as well. Um, yes. So, so yeah. Working parents. Yeah. 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 yeah exactly. Um, so, yeah, I think that brings us to our next question as well in terms of, you know, what what are some hiring strategies that companies should adopt to improve uh, gender diversity in workplaces? Um, so, Sophia, I'll let you uh, lead on this one. OK. Yeah. Um, so for strategies, um, Strategies wise, right? I think there's a few um, um, that companies can adopt or simply just have more companies do start doing so. Um, I think first would be, um, you know, when in terms of shortlisting of candidates and interview process, um, th that should be, uh, it should be ensured that there's a fair 50-50 or at least 60-40 uh, male to female ratio um, that is met as much as possible we won't want, like you, the company shouldn't be doing it just for the sake of it um so like do cons what they should consider doing um also fact and do this while factoring the um, capability and the requirements of the candidates um and another point would be you know um that then removal of names of the candidates or things like education and gender um during the reviewing of the res resumes or decision making process can be actually uh, be considered i mean this will help provide a fair uh, or neutral assessment in the event that the reviewers are skewed towards a particular agenda. Um, another key strategy that I personally believe um, in is that it's, you know, it's, important, uh, for, in, it's important for the diversity and the movement and the belief of it. Um, this should actually start from the top in management. Um, and so hiring the right, uh, right leadership teams uh, who strongly believe in the diversity and the importance of it is, is really critical and and it's not just for the sake of record. I think um, I just want to I think the last strategy that I, I thought would be something that companies can adopt is just um, you know provide flexible plans um, to cover maternity, maternity care insurance. Um, I, I, we have worked with some companies um, clients that where they have covered um, the fees for labor costs as well uh, where, where the female employees go you know go for their labors. So actually a lot of these companies have feedback that they appreciate it as well.
Perfect. Thanks, um, Georgia, Jacqueline. Any anyone? Uh, any questions or any any? Uh, um, you know, from from what Sophia mentioned, because I think it's it's interesting to see the other side as well, right? We we do speak with many different companies and and uh, with candidates as well, so we hear a lot of um, um, you know different uh, uh, points of view and strategies as well that have uh, that have happened, or any strategies that you have implemented as well. I was going to say I'm not heavily involved in the decision making for hiring. Um, I have been known to interview um, to interview staff, um, and I do encourage women to um, apply. And I'm quite transparent about the role, and I'm quite accommodating in regards to a lack of experience in the tech industry. I think attitude is um, supersedes. Uh, experience in the industry um, and as my previous boss gave me a chance within the tech industry and um, I executed well you know it's important for me to to, um, to pay it forward and um, encourage and empower women to do the same yeah um I think I touched on this earlier, so I try and try and be a, a systematic and structured about it to, to in in the, um, in the interest of objectivity. So I actually um, apply a balanced scorecard appraisal mechanism yeah. across all candidates um, yeah. that come through, um, and um, it's based on elements and prioritised and ranked. Um, differently according to the roles um, and responsibilities of, of the different role requirements. Um, so in, in that sense, you know, a lot of it also depends on the talent pool, uh, the applications that come through. Um, and then that leads to, you know, the more intrinsic um, inherent problem of um, attracting more diversity into this area right into the area of programming coding um, data analytics advanced math statistics um, which traditionally have been quite male dominated fortunately fintech requires a lot of legal expertise as well and in that area um, traditionally there's more of a 50 50 balance um, and and to some extent you know being the fin part of tech um, the finance sector um, in some functions, particularly the mid and back offices, um, have in um, conventionally had um, quite a balanced gender diversity. It's it's just in the other aspects um, that are growing in importance, but more increasingly so. I, I think we are seeing AI having more women. So this goes back to the talent pool. Um, blind blind applications are, are fine. Um, but I think in, in at some times also, you want to have a balance. Um, you want to see the face, you want to meet the person, um, particularly in the front office roles, um, depending on which market you're at, because that, that plays a difference, um, that makes a difference in terms of your customer audience. Um, and, and at the end of the day, it's about delivering the performance, yeah. Perfect, thanks, and then, um... Sophia, another one uh, for you regarding recruitment. Um, so, so what role uh, does recruitment play when you know improving gender equality? Mm, well, I think for for start this like this web webinar is like definitely one of the ways, um, at least for us in Storm Two, uh, where we strongly believe in diversity um, because uh, we, here we have a strong leadership that's made out of um, both genders equally. So. You know, you can best believe that you know we advocate both sides in a fair manner, um, and it's mostly based um, around the candidate's capability. Um, and I think we are definitely looking to plan more of the webinars to promote further awareness. Um, also, just to mention, because we, we covered in the previous questions, I think what we can do um, at times will be to remove the gender-related themes. Um, you know, just photos in, during the reviewing of CVs. But um, additionally, I think this is just because um, we tend. Um, I think. In the recruitment side, um, there, there there tend to be some pushback um, on on whether the, there's um, maternity request. Yeah, um, on the small skills, I think during the meetings with our C-suite um, clients and the board 
members um, of our clients, right? We do market sharing intel as well um, as educating and promoting the diversity uh, movements in general. Uh, Georgia, Jacqueline, anything to add on to that one in terms of the role of recruitment? Okay, so um, so yeah, I think we'll um, we'll move on to the next question, which I, I'm really interested to to hear your take on it, Georgia and Jacqueline. Which is, um, if you could share one thing with women who are interested in um, joining the fintech industry, what would that be? Uh, I highly encourage women to join the industry. Um, in Australia, it is thriving. It is exciting, welcoming. It is inclusive. Um, and it is a fast-paced, disruptive environment with a lot of room for growth, career progression, um, and I will say job stability. So I highly encourage women to um, transition from other industries across um it has been an exceptional experience thus far for me and um i have built quite the network um and the community as a result the community is great the community is absolutely fabulous so um for female founders you know a, a lot of I, I think there are a lot out there with fintech ideas i would just say be courageous, seize the opportunities, you know, believe in yourself, lean in, have conviction um, and just go for it and see it through, see it through to con completion, right? Um, and, and you know, don't, don't be daunted by um, if it fails, just go for it, be agile, you know, be agile, be open-minded, pivot, um, have the tenacity, uh, I think women, um, I think one of the things is, you know, be more resilient, see it through, see it through to the end, you know, never say die, keep getting back up, um, yeah, but but accept that there's going to be sacrifices. Um, I think that's one of the things, right? Um, but it's, it's FinTech is here to stay. Um, and then on a personal side, you know, it helps, it helps if you can surround yourself with, strong fabric of supporters um uh, and to founders the journey is quite um will be choppy so find a co-founder um share the load but um fintech's not going anywhere it's here right so um lean in join perfect yeah. thank you and then for our last question um i think we can take it in alphabetical order, so Georgia, Jacqueline, followed by Sophia. Um, so as a woman in FinTech, what's next for you? So Georgia. I think this is, I'm here to stay as well. Um, I think I've, I, I absolutely have found my passion. Um, I would love to leverage off my existing knowledge and help another business. Again, start a new job on Monday. Um, utilize my knowledge um, and apply my expertise to uh, easy pay and help the business um, thrive through uh, my strategic partnership role. Perfect. Jacqueline, what about you? Um, I'm in a different part of fintech. I'm not in payments. I'm in a, a private exchange. It's, so it's capital markets and I'm just gobsmacked, right? I just, Kaidi, you know, amazing. We're bringing, uh, there's a systemic change in financial services industry, in the financial markets, the entire industry is transforming. Um, it's all digitalized, it's digitizing. It's becoming more efficient. It's so much change going on. Um, you know, I, I love capital markets. I, I'm, I'm a capital markets geek. I never thought I would be able to go back into an environment that's innovative in capital markets because it's the traditional banks have all commoditized and, and post GFC, everything's changed. Um, so FinTech capital markets, absolutely love it. Um, there is so much more to come. We're just at the tip of the iceberg. Um, you know, digital currency is coming in all shapes and form. It's not there yet because there's a huge, um, 
there's still a lot of different dimensions that needs to be built up, that needs to be matured. Um, there's a harmonization issue legally, the tax issue globally, the whole e monetary economics is, is still in fluid. But in terms of where we're at, Funder Beam Exchange, the capital markets for private companies, um, we are set to grow. It's very exciting. Um, the time is right now for also secondary shares of private companies. So private companies that are growing, um, that need some liquidity. So early founders that want to monetize some of their early stage, early investment shares with nowhere else to go. You know, our exchange is the exchange. I would like to think um, we have immensely smart people in the in the team at all levels. We are if you want to talk about a strong company with diversity, we are pretty much 50-50. If you look at our leadership team, um, there's 50-50 females, males, and half of us have been founders. You know, so, so there's a lot of experience at both ends from the multinational um, side and the banking world to, you know, startup founder world. So very empathetic to everything um, that relates to fintech and all the companies and founders that are in our community, in our marketplace and continuously improving. So it's a very exciting space. It's not an easy space as Georgia, as you mentioned, fintech is complex, um, but it's not going away. Um, and, um, you know, we encourage more adoption. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite interesting times actually. Mm. Yeah, yeah. To, to put Big it, bangs uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Sophia, what about you? Uh, well, I have never been in fintech, um, but we're a fintech specific recruitment company. I think we run the same way as well. We 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 are equal like as fast paced. Um, you know, I I would think that uh, a lot of the the, the whole. Um, the whole thing that the, the, how we operate what is similar to fintech companies. So for me personally, I think I do think that um, as a woman in in that space, uh, it's important for me um, to just co to continue to ensure that my team and um, the leadership team maintains a, a, a equal um, gender ratio to the best of our ability and and continue to maintain and strengthen the values of and um, and another thing is just also to provide um, a, a safe space for the em employees to feel comfortable being who they are, as well as um, being able to be, you know, share to be able to share and speak uh, speak out um, to us in confidence as well. So I, I think I also look forward to continue running webinars and roundtable discussions um, just to help with the vending and awareness of promoting women in fintech. <laughs> yeah, and feel free to reach yeah. out. I'm yes. here for questions anytime. Support. Yeah, women support women. I saw that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and um, Georgia, we'll we'll see you soon as our you know our our office in um, in Sydney will be opening up soon as well. Um, so yeah, definitely. And and Jacqueline will you know will will grab a drink in Singapore. Um, yeah. Any of our watchers as well, if you're in Singapore or Australia, yeah. let us know. We'd be happy to to meet you all. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, um, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you, Sophia, and our viewers as well. Um, thank you as well for some of the questions that we got. Um, and yeah, I hope you all have a good rest of the week ahead. Um, and I hope you got some, uh, you know, good insights from this conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.